Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken imandari se. Hi, in today's episode, we have with us Tina Mansukhani Garg. Tina is the founder and CEO of Pink Lemonade, a full-service integrated marketing and communications agency headquartered in Bangalore, India. She launched the company in 2011 and today she is known for its award-winning work in the field of creative and business communications and digital services. Tina is a brand communication specialist and has extensive experience in the creative industry having won numerous awards. Tina is passionate about helping women grow and achieve their true potential. Welcome Tina in today's episode. Hello Mahua and thank you for having me here. Thanks Tina. So tell me Tina, why the name Pink Lemonade? Ah, that's a lovely one and lots of people ask me that. Uh, my journey began uh, with me working as a consultant with a lot of different brands. And at one point, I realized that I needed to put this in as a formal setup. And I was looking for a name for a very long time. I, you know, when you're doing naming for yourself, you're overtly uh, careful and you know, particular about what you want. And there wasn't anything that was hitting me for a long time. And then one day out of the blue, I was watching Sound of Music with my little children. And uh, I saw the children in Sound of Music were drinking pink lemonade. And I, the name just stuck with me. And next morning, I woke up from bed and the name Pink Lemonade kept ringing in my head. And I didn't know why it was ringing. And I said, why not an agency called Pink Lemonade that stands for freshness in the work we do. And uh, every brand should have a little panache punch about the way it goes to market. Why not us being that agency that can deliver this for them? And I ran it by a few creative folks in the industry and they said, fantastic name. And that's how it started because it embodies everything that we stand for today. Uh, fresh, vibrant and uh, versatile communication that works for you. So Tina, tell me a little about the brands that you work with. I mean, it'll be very interesting for all our listeners to know. I'm going to come after this and ask you about being a woman and how many people you've employed. And of course, also that digital services was not really understood in 2011 by a lot of people. Sure. So the journey has been a beautiful one. Um, I will have to say thanks to some of the bigger brands. And I remember particularly one gentleman from Symphony Telica who called me and said, I'd like to work with y'all. But are you a brand? Are you an agency today? And uh, I was like, no, I have to set it up and I still have to establish it. So there have been the good brands right from there on. So after 15 days, I set up my work and went back to tell him that, yes, I'm a, I'm an entity today and I'd like to work with you. And boom, we were on board and we were doing something with them. Over the years, there have been beautiful brands and many of them have stayed with us for a long time. And, uh, uh, you know, some of them today we work with Amazon, we work with Flipkart, we work with Mercedes Benz. We work with Swiggy. We work with uh, a ton of others. I mean, uh, there are right from uh, your deep rooted to, um, you know, uh, Curl On, Barbecue Nation. We're working with uh, restaurants like Chianti. We work across different industries. And that's beautiful because we get to work across, on one side, the aerospace industry. On the other side, the lifestyle and beauty industry. On the third side, there's healthcare, GE Healthcare. There's Clicks Capital. There is, um, you know, finance, fintech. There's Biocon. So many of these other brands that have worked with us in different capacities and we've done different work for them. The brilliance of it is there's never a dull day because you're doing something new every day. You're working with a new brand on a daily basis. And the thrill is if you haven't worked with a brand before and you haven't done some of that kind of work and they still believe you can, you're definitely going to, you know, deliver on it. So that's the gorgeous uh, part of what we do. So do you ever have issues, you know, when we work, uh, especially in this creative field, you know, do you have delayed payments and how do you deal with that? Because I think so many people in the creative business, because it's so unorganized in our country and invariably they're the ones who don't receive payments. So have you had situations like that? So Mahua, you've taken uh, the top of mind thought and I don't know how you picked that up because we haven't uh, spoken about it. Um, I'm very, very particular about, um, you know, what the big corporations do today in terms of not paying uh, the MSMEs on time. And this I think I'm very happy to lend my voice to because uh, there are organizations who have practices or rather malpractices of getting our invoices or getting invoices from the smaller ones 
and returning it after a period of 30 days, 60 days saying your invoice has an error or we haven't received your invoice. It's as simple as that. But what is the entrepreneur who is running an entire setup in business? Go back and tell someone like that when they have it as a part of their system and we've known that these people are of a certain kind. Well, beyond a certain point, then the choice remains whether to you work with people with ethics, you work with people who respect the timelines around certain things, because we don't renege on our timelines when we are working with them. You know, in the world of advertising and digital, there's no waiting out there to say that I'll do it tomorrow, even though the time for moment marketing is today. So to a certain extent, um, there are these nuances that exist. There are organizations like the MSME and uh, Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship Game. And they are trying to help organizations with aspects like this. There is RXIL that most entrepreneurs use today. But um, um, we have practices that we've put in place over the last 11, 12 years to help us get around things like this. And the only one message if I may pass on to everybody who may be listening to this from the larger organizations, and if you have uh, you know, the capability to do something about this, on one side, you work with a woman-led organization to bring in supplier diversity. On the other side, you delay payments by 90 days, 120 days. How is it fair? Because then you're defeating the whole purpose of diversity coming in through suppliers. So yeah, maybe something to think about there. Absolutely. There's so much to think about there because, you know, so many companies, they're really, they talk about, uh, you know, inclusion and they talk about diversity. And yet in the same companies, you will find such disparity when it comes to, you know, vendors, as they call uh, anybody who's going to come in and put that bill forward. So for our listeners, you need to know that, uh, you know, that you're not the only one. And there are so many other larger companies also who have gone through this entire drill. But you picked on an important word, which is vendor which is another word that I think needs to be replaced today in the dictionary of uh, creative partners working with larger uh, brands. I think we're partners beyond anything else. And the way we work at Pink Lemonade, I'm very particular on that. You know, uh, you need to go a little over uh, what someone asks you, what a brand needs. You need to be the person to tell the brand, this is what you should be doing because competition is doing this today, because the consumer is looking at something else today. So be that agency that partners in the holistic sense with the brand. But then also the brands need to look at us and say that, hey, you know what, um, it's OK to debate with them on some things and it's OK to hear their views on other things. I certainly don't want to be the agency that is doing creative for you. So I tell brands don't come to us for that. We are definitely going to do more. And partner and brand allyship is the one that I would say uh, we would like to stand for. Do you think that it is a challenge? Because I know that often the word is used as vendor. And, you know, a partnership with anybody who doesn't work within the confines of that office space is not clearly understood with uh, the marketing team, you know. So how does one overcome this sort of a challenge? Um, thankfully, we've been very, very lucky to work with some very mature people and uh, CMOs who come with a good pedigree and who come with good amount of experience to recognize when they see somebody giving them uh, the inputs that are valuable. Many of them have come back and told me that, you know, you have a brilliant team. I'd like to hear more from them. They want to set up a cadence of regular meetings, even if it's not on work that we are doing, to say, we'd like your thoughts even on some of the things that we're not working with. So we've been very fortunate where that's concerned. And I think that's very apparent when you're meeting a, an agency partner right at the beginning to know what kind of support and work you're going to get out of them. On the other side, on the brand side, when you're working with them, start to deliver value. And that's always what I tell my team. What kind of value are you delivering? That they start to look at you as, um, you know, in a different level of partner that you are. So is it that you're bringing them some, um, you know, market intelligence? Is it that you're telling them something that's already garnered from previous experience of working with such brands or categories? And what is it that you're delivering that will position you differently than just being, a, you know, a creative agency? You, we are much more than a creative agency. We are that uh, marketer that comes and talks to them about a whole lot of different solutions and ideas. And ideas is where my, I feel uh, my team is brilliant again. So, you know, pick our brains on those things. And I always tell a client, give us a challenge because we love it. We love it and we will deliver on it. And that is where you're delivering true value. Because that strategic thought is, makes all the world of difference. And execution, I think, is just a matter of the creative talent you have on board. So that is pretty much uh, on par with every agency. You also said that you have 200 employees, am I right? Yes, that is right. And um, some of them are, um, most of them are full-timers today, about 170 of them. 
and the remaining we have on, uh, um, you know, some sort of a part uh, time engagement. I have to be honest, it wasn't by design, but we have about 70-75% women at work today. And that's brilliant. And I am very, very passionate about that. And the ethos of the organization and the culture is so brilliant, if I may say that, you know, Mawa. It is not that it is an organization that is full of women and hence will be a certain kind. I don't belong to that stereotype and I don't condone it at all. I think our organization has ethics and values and culture, which is um, women work very well together and women take on so much to be able to deliver. Not to take away anything from men. There are men also who do this beautifully. But I see the environment at Pink Lemonade and I see the culture and I see a lot of people feeling that openness, feeling that warmth and empathy and feeling um, the degree of, uh, uh, you know, support to be able to do their stuff. Tina, who's Tina? You know, we need to get down to this because I think very few people would have asked you this question. We know you as a CEO of Pink Lemonade of a, a successful businesswoman. Who is Tina? Uh, thank you for asking that. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, I take many opportunities to discuss myself. And I think that's, again, a woman trait. We don't bring ourselves to the fore at all. We're always at the back. We're always supporting, giving, um, you know, uplifting, um, enabling if those are the words that I can say, and sacrificing, of course. Tina is, I'd like to say, a vivacious personality who is extremely curious, loves understanding and uh, learning at all points in time, is someone who um, uh, gets troubled by insensitive people, gets troubled by nastiness in the world, tries hard to do the right thing, and sometimes, you know, my husband and uh, kids and I have a joke in the family. If we are traveling at the airport or if we are at any government office or entity where people are doing the wrong thing, I'm going to be the one who walks up and says, please don't break that line or please don't do the wrong thing. And they say, Mama, why can't you just leave it? Why can't you just not do these kind of things? So there is, a, you know, being a defense kid, there is a, a degree of wanting to do right, being the good citizen of the country. There is um, an ability to take care of people. I'm always a giver before a taker. And I'd like to give as much of myself as well as as much of opportunities that I can and create opportunities, open networks and opportunities for people. Um, and that is something I do a lot as well. But inside, I think I am a person who is um, also likes to be quiet much as I am a, a talker. I'd like to be a quiet also in many moments, reading in a quiet nook enjoying nature and uh, the greenery around me and a poet in different ways. I'm a writer in different ways. So that is my world and uh, fiercely protective of the people I love. How wonderful. So Tina, uh, before we end this episode, I would like you to talk to women who want to reboot because reboot, I have rebooted myself. And um, there's so much of fear because I try and encourage a lot of my friends who are sometimes so fearful of, uh, you know, after they've done with raising their children and, you know, they're done with everything that they're expected to do. How do these women reboot? What is it that me as a rebooter, I had to really muster all my courage to go out there and not care about what people said about my age, what people said about uh, my abilities, because I just had... Um, you know, self-belief. Uh, uh, what would you like to uh, say for Rebooters? Because you are a company that employs a lot of women and I'm sure there are many women who take a break once they've had a child and they've gone through the whole, you know, motherhood journey. It does take many years of their working life from them. What yes. would you like to tell uh, them? Um, I think, first of all, Mahua, congratulations. Because if you're a woman who's um, lived with that degree of self-belief, you owe yourself many pats on your back. Because that is the first thing that happens to women who fall out of the outside work, you know, not at home. I do believe women work a lot at home. So the, um, what I'm talking about is working in the corporate world or working outside of the home with a brand, with a corporate, with an office, in an office. And uh, if you're not going out that way, I think the first thing that kills you is the ability um, to be confident. People lose their confidence. Women lose their confidence. In fact, Pink Lemonade um, has a great degree of people who we try to bring back, not with us, but with other brands and other places where we groom them to come back to work, go out into the world and get something done in the space of digital marketing. So anyone can approach us for this and we have regular sessions that we train uh, people on. And I'm a big advocate of this, that if someone hasn't done it before, it doesn't mean they can't do it. You know, you have to have 80% attitude, 20% aptitude. If you haven't done it before, you can do it. 
It's not that you can never do it. Come in with the right attitude. Your attitude needs to be 80% and the rest it will take care of, right? You don't need to come in with um, uh, no learning or no awareness or very little awareness. You will learn if you have the right spirit to be able to learn. Um, we've kind of brought back a lot of people into the workplace and I have been able to place them at different places where they are running a very successful career. Some of our own team members have been people who have shifted vocations and moved out of careers and come into a career that they are exemplary at today. But I think um, an important thing for anyone wanting to reboot is that it's an inner job. You've got to first tell yourself that I'm going to be able to do it. And then on the outside, there are umpteen courses available today. There are umpteen learning opportunities. There are beautiful returnee internships. Have you explored all of that for, to come back into the world and be able to do, um, you know, a little bit there, learn with someone and then probably take a bigger platform? There's so many opportunities. What stops us? Things like, oh, it's too far from my home. Oh, I don't think I'll be able to do it. Come then talk to someone who you, you know, who's been there and done that before to be able to say that I'm going to cover this bit before. But the journey is an uphill task in your own mind and heart first, because everybody else will come out there and support you when you ask. And the difference is only in asking. If you ask, it will be there. What are the four things that you would uh, say for attitude? You know, because I think attitude is one of those greatest things that can be the killer or it can be, you know, the winning part in you as a person. So one, I'd like to say, um, it's a common um, adage, the attitude of gratitude. But I think it's a big one and I'll tell you what I think about it. The human mind is always sticking to the negative, you know, and um, we don't doubt the negative at all. If someone tells you uh, XYZ is like this, you will believe it. XYZ did this or said this, you will believe it. But when if someone tells you ABC stands for this and you know how lovely that is, you'll say, really? And you, there is a tendency to stick to the negative. And if that is the case... The only way you can get out of this negative, which is also um, a, a second pointer that I want to say, keep the attitude of dispelling the negative from your life. Keep the attitude of saying, I don't want to listen to that bit which is negative because I'd like to, you know, um, uh, because it is eating you somewhere inside. Stay with the positive as much as you can. One of the ways of doing that is what I said first, is the attitude of gratitude. The more you're grateful for the good things that happen in your life, the more you will automatically dispel the negative. You don't have time for that. The third thing I'd say is that um, stop listening to what people have to say, because the more you think about it, it'll only, um, you know, regurgitate with you. And... Um, the way to do this is that use your time for a positive uh, impact or positive activity at every given point in time. I heard this from one of my uh, customers and uh, are now a good friend as well, that, you know, she's always upbeat and happy because there's just so much to do. There is no time to look at what is not working well and not what is not uh, going to serve you well. Hear it and then discard it because there is so much more positive time to invest. There is only so much time, right? So use it to invest in something that can make an impact rather than moping about something else. Um, the last thing that I'd like to say about attitude is that uh, what is it that you can do to support the community around you? And I believe very strongly in this, that if there is a giver inside of us, try giving it and, um, you know, awakening that giver to do better for the community around you. And you'll be surprised how much impact it has on your attitude in general. You know, because when you see the underserved, and when you see people around you who are not having those opportunities, despite deserving a world of equity, I think it changes something inside of us when we volunteer time, when we do support for others. Try and help others as much as you can. That changes your attitude completely. Uh, so Tina, you know what, you'd be the right person to tell me about the struggles an entrepreneur faces, you know, when they start out on a business. How is it that they can become a brand? You know, they'll approach business and people will approach them for business because that's one really crazy line that entrepreneurs face. Yes, I agree, actually, that um, in a journey of entrepreneurship, um, you know, someone told me this, that if you don't understand finance, you don't have any business to be in business. And I'd like to say finance is a skill that I can still get people for. If you don't know what your brand is worth and what you're doing in terms of uh, creating value, then uh, you're really just doing it as a passion and a practice and you're not doing it as a brand. A lot of people and a lot of women that I come across grow to a certain level and they're not realizing that they're working in the same way. What got them here will not get them forward take them forward. So what is it that they should change at some point in time? Start looking at a professional team to come together. 
start to, um, and why do why only women i see lots of men go through this i see lots of brands in their journey go through this and i also see very good brands that right from the onset are very very particular that i want to know what my market is like i want to know what is the play or positioning i have in this market how do i represent myself and then complete the entire marketing journey to say what do i behave like what do i talk like what's my brand voice what's my activity etc and i see uh, many of them continuing and chugging along in the same way that they started out and not really realizing that at some point that little um, entity they started has become something worth contending with and that's when um, they start waking up and saying that okay can what can i do i'd say do this much earlier in your journey setting a vision where do you want to go and where do you want it to be at which point does it stop being just a business and it becomes a well known brand and when i say brand again what is a brand it is the thought that a consumer carries regarding your label or your um, you know business name entity what does it stand for you have to plan it right from the beginning also i see people are shy to talk about their businesses i've seen this both in men and women we're shy to talk about what we do because we think it's not as big enough but i want to ask you something is there any th- brand that you buy out there that has not reached you either via an advertising advertisement or it's not reached you by a word of mouth or you've seen it somewhere on uh, a hoarding etc or that little television um, ad you've got to know of it from somewhere then we go buy it right why should someone invest in your business if they don't know what you do if nobody tells them what you do now the question is will someone else tell them or it has to be you who has to start the journey of storytelling this is where i think entrepreneurs struggle with we have a great idea we have a great product and sometimes i don't see them uh, going out and doing the right marketing for themselves um that's one of the areas of course the other areas i think talent is important a culture is very important for people to build you get known for something you set up a culture you speak about that culture you advocate and live that culture as a second way of life or a way of life every day you just can't fake it you've got to be that in reality there will always be naysayers because everyone who's successful gets spoken about in some way or the other when you carry that mantle of being the navigator at the helm i think um, it is important to set that vision and take care of some of these elements besides just the finance and besides just doing your product and manufacturing or production or whatever so these little things go very far in the journey it's a well rounded space to cover and there's never a day that you don't have a different kind of an issue to deal with be ready for that be ready for that long road thank you tina for being on today's episode it was wonderful having you here thank you mawa and um, kudos to what you're doing i think giving people a voice to be able to think about some of these things and talk about them superb and phenomenal work and i look forward to hearing more of your podcast thank you do you our dearest listeners you can find us on your favorite streaming services spotify amazon music apple podcast and of course on all other major streaming services with loads of love we are the mohua show where we talk imandari se